Um, uh, thanks, everyone. We've had a little bit of te technical difficulty, uh, just if you haven't heard that. So um, Eric is able to speak. Uh, he's not able to hear us. So I will convey uh, some things via chat with him, all of the questions via chat, and he can respond um, accordingly. So with that, let me give a brief intro. Thanks for everyone for participating in Virtual Antech. Uh, my name is Scott Eastman. I'm the Vice President of Sections for the Society. I wanna thank everybody for all of the things that they do uh, to make this happen from the speakers, the participants, the virtual exhibitors and sponsors. Thanks everyone. Um, I encourage you to um, participate in the rest of the day. We've got some, some awesome speakers uh, this morning as well as in the afternoon. We've got some, a bit of entertainment at about 12.30 by yours truly. Uh, we'll see if, uh, hopefully it's enjoyable. It'll certainly be embarrassing for me. <clears throat> um, so without further ado, I wanna just introduce Eric Oaks. Um, he's the uh, materials and process engineer, engineer at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's a member of the materials and engineering and test evaluation group for over 20 years. Uh, Eric's been involved in a number of flight and research uh, projects, including all four Mar Mars rover missions, Deep Impact, InSight, just to name a few things that he's done. Uh, and his expertise encompasses polymer matrix composites, design and fabrication, adhesive bonding, and, and many other things. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric and he can uh, give us his presentation and please send the questions to me and I will convey them to Eric. So hopefully I'll uh, shoot him a text and we'll get started. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning in these trying times. Uh, my name is Eric Oaks, and I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, pictured here is the newly named rover for Mars 2020. The name seems kind of fitting now, Perseverance. Uh, today we'll talk about JPL's background, uh, our plastic selection methodologies, uh, commonly used plastics at JPL, uh, plastic hardware from past missions, uh, material challenges on current missions, and our additive manufacturing that we've used, and a few future challenges on two of the upcoming missions. Uh, here's a picture of Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, back in 1930 at Caltech, on the Caltech campus, some Caltech students and rocket enthusiasts, they accidentally blew up a lab. So Caltech had to move to the current location in the San Gabriel uh, foothills. And as you can see, we're right on the edge of Metro Los Angeles. And on lab, we actually have a herd of deer that roam around, uh, occasional uh, bear sighting and occasional uh, mountain lion sighting. So there's a lot of wildlife that just wander around the lab. In 1944, JPL got its uh, official name as Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The lab was sponsored by the US Army and it was used as a facility to research uh, rockets. Uh, back then, the rockets were called Corporal 1 and Corporal 2. And when NASA was formed in 1958, JPL was transferred to NASA. And once they were transferred to NASA, we've been operated as a federally funded research facility. And today, we have about 8,000 employees on lab every day. And currently, due to the virus, we have a maximum of 500 people. Uh, the only reason people come on lab right now is basically to do testing for Mars 2020 since it's launching in July and our security and internal people there and the spacecraft operations that run all the satellites that are run through JPL. So at JPL, we've had many firsts throughout aerospace history. We had the first US sat uh, satellite to successfully orbit the earth. Uh, the first Ranger 7, the first US spacecraft to reach the moon. Mariner 4, the first close-up image of another planet. Mariner 9, the first spacecraft to orbit another planet. Mariner 10, the first spacecraft to use the force of gravity around one planet to reach another. 
the twin voyagers, the first grand tour of outer planets of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Galileo, the first spacecraft to join to orbit Jupiter, and Cassini, the first spacecraft to orbit Saturn. This is just a short list of first. There are many more that I could talk about. We have many more upcoming. A good example is the Mars helicopter, Leonardo, that will land on Mars next year, on Mars 2020. And since we do a lot of one-of-a-kind stuff, unfortunately, not everything works. We could do all the engineering correct. There's a million things that go into it, and one, fall, uh, one mistake could end up with a failure. But thankfully, we're a lot more successful than we are at failing. And we, with a lot of the issues that you can't actually send a guy to go fix these spacecraft once they're in space, we're very risk adverse and very conservative with our approach to designs. And a kind of a joke on lab is that we're on the trailing edge of technology. And what we're most popular for and no, most noticed for is probably the Mars missions. On the left here is the picture of Sojourner, the rover that landed in 1997 on July 4th. It traveled only 100 yards on Mars and it was designed only last seven souls, which is a Martian day, which is 24 hours and 39 minutes, and actually ended up lasting 83 souls. The picture here is the test rover for Spirit and Opportunity, which Opportunity traveled 28 miles and Spirit traveled 4.8 miles before it had a wheel that got stuck, so it drug a wheel around for quite a while. And here is the test rover for Curiosity. And currently Curiosity has been on Mars for 2,000, 300 souls and is traveling around. And pictured here is the Mars InSight lander. Uh, that was actually built by Lockheed Martin in Denver area and managed by JPL. But it landed on Mars November 26, 2018. And in April 2019, it detected the first Mars quake. So here's our plastic selection methodologies, the structural aspect of things, strength, modulus, creep, the thermal, the use temperature. We have some projects that have a thermal range that from plus 230C to minus 230C, thermal conductivity, thermal expansion. The CT mismatches between materials is always a design struggle. The electrical properties, the dielectric constant, our RF engineers like a low constant, and they also like the material to be have the same constant throughout the material. The lost tangent, the RF engineers like a low lost tangent as low as possible, the electrical conductivity and the static dissipative to avoid static discharges due to ESD issues. Fabrication can be costly because we don't do mass production. We build usually a maximum about five of each item. Uh, the machinability, the molding, bonding, painting, and the 3D printing options. Environmental, the outgassing, radiation exposure and atomic oxygen erosion. And the cost, the cost is typically not the driving factor of how we choose materials. We focus morely on performance since we are not a money-making business. Uh, and the other main cost part we have is the development of material allowables. We do a lot of testing to make sure that we have all of our design allowables correct for our uh, stress analysts, the fabrication costs. And the raw material costs, for example, a composite prepreg that we use, they have a high minimum order and your, the minimum you can purchase is about $50,000 of material, and we usually don't use nearly as much as we actually have to buy. So some of the commonly used plastics that we have is the cyanate esters, they're fiber for the fiber reinforced composites, radomes, structures, polyamide, the nylon, polyurethane for paint, conformal coatings, and foam, polyepoxides, G10 thermal standoffs, FR4 circuit boards, Rogers 4003, Structural adhesives, film adhesives, polyamides for heaters, flex cables, circuit boards, tape, metallized thermal blankets, the pressure sensitive adhesives for acrylics, polyethermides, 3D printing and Ultem, and then polytetrafluoroethylene for Rogers 6002 and the Teflon wire coating on most of the wiring that we use. So here's, I'll talk, start talking about some of the projects in the past and the plastics we've used and the challenges that we've had with these parts. Uh, pictured here is the deep impact S-band antenna. It was the main telecom link between the orbiter and the impactor, and it, com it impacted Comet Temple 1 on July 4, 2005. This antenna was a, one of the first that we built at JPL that's a patch antenna, and it 
combine the antenna into the structure into one piece, saving space and a lot of mass. And we used a copper coated polyamide. You can see the copper surface here. An astrocorts reinfest cyanate ester, 960 Kapton tape, and EA9392 adhesive. So this had a lot of material challenges. The fact that the patches that you see in this area here, there's a patch in the middle layer of this that has to be precisely aligned under that patch. And then the ground plane layer, which is this layer, on the other side of this layer, there was wiring that goes through the middle layer and these feed throughs all had to be put in. So each patch had two feed throughs and there's 36 feed throughs that had to be lowered on, put through holes that could then be soldered after the fact. And we used hollow needles to capture the wires as we dropped the piece over the feed throughs that then they could solder it and then put the final top layer of patches on. And the other thing we did to align the patches is you can see these tooling holes. We built the part oversized with the tooling holes and then we machined it to its final shape and that machined out the tooling holes. And then we covered the edges with uh, nice tape to uh, eliminate the FOD issue of the honeycomb core that was in the middle of it. Next is a good example that not everything that we build at JPL goes to space. This is a UAV SAR that's an L-band antenna. It uses repeat pass interferometry to observe surface def deformations such as volcanoes and earthquake faults. So you can fly this plane over earthquake faults and volcanoes. You can see the ground movement down to a millimeter scale. It was fabricated in 2006 and they actually still use it today. And it flies on the bottom of the NASA Gulfstream G3. You can see the pod here. That surface there is the radome that covers the, pat the antenna tiles. Oops. The materials used was a Rogers 6002 uh, Urlane radome paint. We actually used the same paint the Space Shuttle used and it's called Space Shuttle White. And Astrocorps fiber reinforced cyanate ester for the radome. The material challenges we had here is the Rogers 6002 has size limitations of what Rogers Corporation can make. Originally we wanted to make the antenna into one large tile, but as they looked into the materials they could use, they realized the 6002 was smaller and then they decided it was a lot easier to test just a tile size of the antenna. So we could make these smaller tiles and they could test each tile before they bonded onto the large structure. And the other problem we had was again, similar to the deep, uh, the deep impact S-band antenna, each of these little patches here has a feed through that goes down to the ground plane. And we had to lower it down onto there to, um, to, low, to be able to connect the patch to the bottom ground plane. And again, with these, we also built these oversized with tooling holes to align the patches. But then you can see these tooling holes here. These helped us align the, the tiles to with respect to with each other on the large panel. And the other problem we had was attaching the tiles to the actual ground plane of aluminum honeycomb. And we used a silver filled epoxy, but we had to make sure that none of the epoxy seeped into these gaps to have any metal or anything that was conductive above the ground plane because it would affect the RF performance of the antenna. So next we have the warm electronics box from Spirit and Opportunity. You can see here's the box on one of the test rovers. Here's a picture of the one of the flight ones. It's upside down, but here's where the wheels attach on. You can see that same piece right in here. So on these, it, it was this a one electronics box was also insulated with aerogel. You can see the gray material here is the aerogel. And that's on the inside and it was closed out with a Astro Quartz gold coated Kapton layer on the inside of it. So this used the graphite and Astro Quartz fiber reinforced cyanate ester, EA9309.3 epoxy and FM73 and gold coated polyamide. A lot of the challenges we had was this, was the CT mismatch between the titanium fittings, which are these large fittings here, and the graphite reinforced composite. We realized after we thermal cycled it for how cold Mars gets, the CT mismatch is creating thermal loads in there that were cracking the adhesive bond. And we figured we could put two layer, two plies of astrocorts onto the graphite and that minimized the CT mismatch and created like a CT buffer and after we thermal cycled it with the adhesive, we found that the parts had positive margins. And along with this also, we had to develop a lot of adhesive design allowables. We started with five adhesive candidates and we would test the adhesive 
at the high temperature and the low and at room temperature. And each adhesive has 10 samples at each temperature. And we ended up choosing 9309.3 due to its uh, properties that are a lot higher at cold temperature than the other adhesives we tried. Next, we have the InSight seismometer tether. This connected the seismometer to the spacecraft. You can see here on Mars, there's the tether was right there on the deck. And it tethered the Velcro, the Velcro tethered, the attached the tether to the actual deck on InSight. Uh, InSight was built again by Lockheed Martin and managed by JPL. A lot of the testing that was done at JPL for the Velcro testing. We used a polyamid flex cable, nylon Velcro, and EA9394 epoxy. Uh, the challenges we had is the nylon Velcro properties over, temperature, over the temperature range. So originally we took two inch Velcro and bonded that to the polyamid flex cable and we pulled on it and we realized that the way Velcro fails is it has a peak load. When you first start to peel it, the load decreases and plateaus off as the Velcro is peeled. That initial peel load was a lot higher than what the arm could have uh, lift. The arm on InSight could only lift 15 pounds. So we started to decrease the size, the width of the Velcro. And we found that if you cut the hook side of the Velcro, it creates a lot of FOD. So the piece we actually cut was the only, was the, I'm sorry, the loop side is what creates FOD. We cut the hook side. And as we tested it, we noticed that at cold temperature, the nylon gets a lot stiffer and it increases that initial preload or the peel load. And then the plateau also increases. So we had to thin out the Velcro. And then you can see here, we also created, we cut it to a point and that point there decreased that initial peel load that spiked. And so the load would only increase to a lower plateau load so the arm could physically pick up the tether. The other part we realized is that we had to make sure that the the Velcro is still strong enough to hold the tether at room temperature during launch. So we came up with a quarter inch wide strip on both sides of the flex cable of the hook side. The other one was the valid Velcro test methods. We wanted to peel at least six inches, which is similar to the ASTM tape peeling test. But the problem is the Instron we have at JPL that has all the thermal chambers to do the cold temperature testing only has a stroke length of four inches. But through a lot of testing, we realized that we only needed the first two and a half inches of data. And that got us uh, enough data to show we could decrease the initial peel load. The other problem was the bonding procedure. So we originally started with the low viscosity adhesive and we quickly realized that the adhesive will flow through the nylon Velcro and it will bond the hooks and the loops down and make the Velcro useless. So we switched to EA9394 because it's a higher viscosity and we basically would put down a very thin layer about seven thousandths of an inch and then bond the Velcro down. And that minimized the amount of adhesive that could flow through the Velcro uh, bonding the hooks and the loops. And you can see here on Mars, these pictures are actually from the InSight lander. You can see the Velcro, the two inch wide strip. Here's the arm at the JPL test bed lifting up the seismometer and here you can see the tether. Next, we have the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity and Mars 2020 Rover Perseverance. I'll discuss these two since they are very similar. They do have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences with them. Curiosity was launched November 26, 2011 and landed August 6, 2012. Perseverance scheduled its launch window starts July 17th of this year and it's scheduled to land February 18th of 2021. Uh, the main differences or the main similarities are that they use the exact same descent stage. The descent stage being used on Mars 2020 is the actual flight spare from MSL. The back shell was a build a print from Mars 2020. Uh, there's a few pieces here like the heat exchangers, those are rebuilds, uh, the UHF antenna, and the main structure of it was very, very similar. Uh, some of the changes though is the wheels, they found on Mars, on Curiosity, the wheels uh, started getting dents and holes in them. So the wheels got a little thinner, but with thicker face uh, metal skins on them of the aluminum. And the biggest difference, which is the biggest upgrade for this is in the front here, it's called the caching system. 
they took a big chunk and inside of here is an arm that has uh, tubes that the coring drill will put the samples into the tubes and then the tubes will be dropped off on Mars and that will be gathered by a future mission to bring those samples back to Earth. And so the main structure is very similar, it just has different instruments on it. And by reusing a lot of things and not designing everything brand new, it actually ended up saving the project hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Mars 2020 is budgeted, I think about $3 billion and MSL was at about 2 billion. And they said if they would have gone and redesigned an entire thing, it probably would have been over $4 billion and probably not been approved. The other thing on Mars 2020 is on the bottom here, it'll be a helicopter. This picture is a little old before the helicopter was moved to the bottom of the rover. And when the rover lands on Mars, it'll drive and find a spot that has a, the ground is at max at a five degree angle. There's a dust shield that covers the helicopter because as the descent stage lands the rover on Mars, they, the rockets will push up rocks and they don't want the rocks to hit the helicopter. It's a very fragile piece and if a rock hit it and damaged any of the blades, the helicopter wouldn't be able to fly. So the rover will land, find a sm uh, place to drop the helicopter. It'll drop the dust shield. It'll drive forward, drop the helicopter. Then it has to drive forward so the helicopter can use its solar panel to power up because it only has a, about 15 to 20 minutes of power in its batteries. And then the rover will continue to drive away and then it will drop what they call the ejectable belly pan. And the belly pan opens up the area of the rover that they then can put the core samples into the tubes and then decide where to drop those off at a future spot. And another interesting one, um, instrument that Perseverance has is MOXIE, which is an instrument that will make oxygen that is the precursor to possibly having astronauts go to Mar Mars in the future. And with these rovers, the biggest challenges are the uh, planetary protection bakeouts uh, to make sure that we don't bring any of the bugs with us. These, all the parts get uh, baked out at very high temperatures and a lot of the plastics degrade due to these high temperatures. So one of the ways they can lower the temperature and increase the amount of time that they bake out the parts. And the contamination control, you can't have anything outgassing on these parts due to all the optics and all the outgassing and vapors will go to those optics. And the structural analysis and design allowables, we don't really trust vendor data that much. So we test everything that we use and it can get very expensive very quickly. And the paint and cabling durability. Uh, one of the biggest changes we made was the paint. On MSL, the white paint, you actually could not wipe it clean. So once you painted something, if it got dirty on lab during fabrication, it just stayed dirty. Uh, we changed Mars 2020 to a silicone paint where you could actually wipe and try and clean. So now I'll talk about some parts that are on the Mars missions. This is a parachute closeout cone lid. It gets hit by the parachute canister at about 60 Gs. And this part is actually rebuilt and used on MSL and Mars 2020. It uses a graphite fiber reinforced cyanate ester, aramid fibers, FM300-2U film adhesive, and EA9394. Some of the challenges were that this part had to be designed to minimize the amount of energy it absorbs from the parachute canister, but also survive load or launch. So you see these areas where there's the fasteners that hold it onto the parachute closeout cone. And we didn't want that to be attached too tightly and too strong as the parachute canister crushes through it. And we had to develop accurate test methods and the assembly cost. So this part, originally when we built it, it failed its proof load. And we, in all of the JPL reviews, it was never noticed that it had a design flaw and had a point load that created peel in the honeycomb panel. And as it was being proof loaded, all of a sudden you heard cracking and it peeled the face skin off. So we changed and put these angled doublers along the edges. And so that design was then taken to the parachute test range and they would push a, a, parach a parachute test canister through it at 60 Gs. And this piece has been tested. You can see all the large cracks along the edges. And when they did one of the tests, they realized that the radome that's right here, it would peel off and they did the ballistic coefficient of that radome, and they realized that the radome could come back down and possibly hit the parachute on the descent stage. And if the radome would penetrate the parachute, it would tear the parachute and the parachute would get shredded 
and the descent stage would smash into Mars and the mission would be over before it even really started. So we added these Kevlar straps that were bonded on with EA9394. And the thought was that those straps would hold the radome in place right after the parachute canister hit the lid. And the problem was we were running out of time and running out of material and we didn't have enough time to test this design. So it looks very crude and kind of ugly, but we over-designed it to be as conservative as possible, knowing that we weren't gonna be able to test this design before it flew. So after MSL and when Mars 2020 was approved, this part was built to print and we were able to build another one and actually test the Kevlar strap concept. And looking at this uh, high speed pictures, we saw the radome try to peel off and get held in place by the Kevlar strap. So our conservative approach actually ended up working. And you can see here is the parachute closeout cone lid attached onto the cruise stage. And there's the radome. Uh, it's, it's on it. So on the Mars missions, there's also these three radomes that we fabricated using an Astro Quartz si uh, reinforced cyanate ester. We have the TLGA radome that goes on the parachute closeout cone, the PLGA radome, which goes on the parachute closeout cone lid, and the RLGA radome that goes actually on the rover. The material challenge here is just the fabrication costs. This radon has a lot of complex curves and it was really difficult to lay up. Next we have the UHF antenna. It was used on Curiosity, Insight, and it will be used on Perseverance. It's a Ashquartz reinforced cyanate ester and a copper coated polyimide. The main challenges we had were positioning the copper and the electrically conduct connecting the top copper to the side copper. So here you can see it's that barbershop pole part. This part was fabricated by laying up the astro quartz onto an aluminum tool, curing that, and then bringing the aluminum on, or the copper coated polyamide, bonding that on. And that was bonded on at the same time that top piece. In this gap area, we were worried that the soldering temperature was going to damage the astro quartz when they went to solder a piece of copper foil to make the electrical connection between the top and the sides. And then after some testing, we found that it did not affect the properties of it. And the UHF antenna that's on the rovers has a dome on top of here to cover these wires because as the rovers are dropped down onto Mars, when they cut the tethers, they don't know where those tethers will fly off of. And they're worried as the tethers go by, since they're on the very top of the rover, they're worried those tethers could catch the wires and pull them out. And the other kind of interesting thing is on InSight, you can see the UHF antenna here. They're worried the arm is going to hit it. So they built a, we built a guard that cut, that uh, protected it. So if the arm hit that guard, it wouldn't actually damage the UHF antenna. So one of the upcoming projects that's uh, launching soon or next year is SWAT. It's going to do the take the topography of Earth's surface water. It has two deployable reflector arrays here on the sides. So this arm folds in and these reflector arrays fold in also. And then at, in orbit, they all deploy out. And these reflector rays are actually covered, have these antenna panels. And we used Roger 6002, a cyanate reinforced cyanate ester, an epoxy film and paste adhesive. The material challenges we had here are the, in, the uh, panel flatness, the fabrication processing, and the etching and processes of the patch alignment and the CT of the parts. So this picture here is the original project that was called Wide Swath that started back in 2001. And originally we took the Rogers 4003 and bonded it onto honeycomb panels. And that project was just a technology demonstration. And then they got advanced along to the actual flight project. And you see here are the actual flight panels in a thermal cycle chamber. So originally we thought we could use the Duroid, the Rogers 6002 on both sides of a honeycomb, make a honeycomb panel. But we found quickly that the, the Rogers 6002 isn't stiff enough. So what we added is we, co-cured the Rogers material onto graphite face skins and then bonded the, and then those went and had the etching done on the copper patches. Those then were bonded to honeycomb to create a honeycomb panel. So even though only one side of the panel is used as the reflector surface, the other side of the panel is the exact same to keep the symmetry along the middle line of 
the honeycomb panel. And the other issue is since you have the graphite for the stiffness, it also has a very low CTE. And there's these titanium flexures that hold the panels so they're thermally stable in the whole reflector array. And the tolerance is before, between every single patch. So you have one patch here, it has to be tightly tolerant to a patch that could be on the whole other end of the reflector, which is going to be uh, difficult to put them on the reflector and set everything up. Unfortunately, their launch date of September 2021 may be delayed a little while due to the virus. Uh, they're currently building the spacecraft at JPL and getting it ready, but they don't, they're not considered an essential project right now, so they're not allowed to go on lab. Another upcoming one we have is Europa Clipper. Its launch date is 2023 and 2024. Uh, this one also is not considered an essential project. So, and the other problem with the launch date is uh, they don't have a uh, rocket picked yet for it. So they're not sure when the launch will be. Uh, some of the instruments on it is an instrument called Reason. It's able to see under the ice and the scientists are really interested on how thick the ice is on Europa, uh, what the water's like under Europa. If Europa is producing heat that has warm water push up through the ice and this radar will be able to tell all that inf information has three magnetometers on this mag boom. It will do the magnet, uh, the, they will do the uh, magnetic fields of Europa. Then there's SUDA, which is a surface dust mass analyzer, and then RADMON, which is a radiation monitor of the radiation of Europa. So the challenges that we, we have here are the radiation exposure. It's in the gigarad range, and the temperature range is minus 240 to plus 240C. Uh, getting a temperature cycle chamber down to minus 240C, they're not very big, and there's not many of them around the world. Uh, we are partners with this project with Applied Physics Laboratory and Johns Hopkins University. And thankfully, thankfully they have a cryo test chamber. So they do most of the minus 240C testing. And then the other problem we have is a lot of the plastic insulators, their ESD properties. Uh, as things get cold, you get more discharges due to ESD on insulated materials. So we'll talk about the mag boom. It's a deployable boom three magnetometers. We used a protruded S2 glass by Sphenol A epoxy longerons, metallized polyamide shielding sock, and a graphite fiber reinforced cyanate ester. Uh, this is a heritage hardware from Northrop Grumman Innovative Systems in Goleta, California. They build these deployable antennas here on a lot of other space missions. Uh, the problem was some of the challenges we have is the mechanical testing of the longerons, the environment, the radiation dose could be up to 220 mega rad and the extremely low temperature. And we took, you can see a control piece of the longerons is this whitish yellow color. So we were worried what the radiation would do to the stiffness of these parts. So we went, we, we would do four point bending on the control sample we would go and radiate the samples to 50 mega rad, and then we pulled them out and did the four point bend test on the exposed. Then we went to 100 mega rad, then 150, then 200, and finally 220. And we found the stiffness only increased by two to 3%, which is acceptable for what we need. And the one problem with the low temperature, is even that this boom gets deployed right after launch, when it gets to Europa, there still will be some stresses that move the boom a bit. And so the sock that we have, we're worried that at minus 230C, it could crack the sock material and create FOD. And any minor movement might create cracking and over time that cracking could create a lot of issues. And the other problem we have is the modeling radar signature of the boom. Currently the boom is not RF transparent or RF visible, it's in between. And the reason engineers on their antenna, they want the boom to either be transparent or visible, and they can't really model something that's in between the two. So they currently are looking at possibly moving the boom angle to get it away from reason, but that creates a lot of other problems. So there's a lot of trade-offs they're doing right now. They might add another RF absorbing layer onto the sock that's already there that will make it RF visible to help with the reason antenna. 
And on that boom are these three magnetometers. They track Europa's magnetic field. This uses a plastic fiber reinforced cyanated ester, G10, and carbon loaded peak. Uh, the material challenges we have are the G10 ESD properties, the magnetic properties, the CTE radiation effects, and the mechanical properties development. So in this assembly, it needs to be thermally isolated from the rest of the spacecraft. So it has G10 bipods. But the problem with the G10 bipods is that they're not conductive, so they have ESD discharges. So the way that we're going to try and mitigate that is we're going to paint it with a black BR-127 that's conductive. And the other issue we have is the magnetic properties. Not one material in this entire assembly can be magnetic, except for the flux gate magnetometer piece. And the CT is a problem also, because as the temperature decreases and changes, any change in size creates a minor magnetic field. And then that could affect the magnetometer's measurement properties. And the mechanical properties development, we're doing a lot of testing to get the actual B basis allowables on the G10. Even though the vendor does provide data, we can't use that as allowables because we don't know the background, how many samples were tested, and if it was an average they're quoting or if it's a B basis allowable number. Another part is the high gain antenna. It's a all composite structure. It uses a graphite fiber reinforced cyanate ester and EA9394. Uh, the main challenges we have here are the cyanate esters ESD properties and the film adhesive ESD properties. So even though on the composite, the fibers themselves are conductive and they will not discharge, but the layers of resin between the fibers and the surface, even though that layer is less than a thousandth of an inch thick, that layer could create discharges that could discharge two other parts on the spacecraft. So one of the things we're looking at now is abrading off that thin layer and possibly painting it with black BR-127. There are still a lot of studies that we're going to do and a lot of testing, but unfortunately, since the virus, we can't actually get on lab to do any of the testing yet. And the other problem is the film adhesive, the actual adhesive that bonds to the honeycomb is also an insulator. And that thin layer on the inside of the honeycomb could discharge, that could get outside of the out of, outside of the HGA and possibly discharge onto something else. So we're gonna test that also. If that comes out to be an issue, what we'll do is we'll find a vendor that will carbon load a film adhesive that will make the film adhesive conductive enough not to discharge onto other parts. Uh, unfortunately, they've already built all the base pieces for this. So if we end up finding the film adhesive is a part, we're gonna to have to rebuild a lot of stuff. And just getting a film adhesive is actually a very long lead time and we'll have to do a lot of testing to show that the new carbon loaded film adhesive is sufficient enough to have positive margins. Now I'll talk about the additive manufacturing of parts at JPL that we've flown and we haven't done much in the 3D printing area. Again we're on the trailing edge of technology and we are very conservative and looking at the initial 3D printing capabilities the amount of testing and paperwork that had to be done to show that you could fly a 3D printed part was an extensive and very expensive process. So here we have Sentinel-6. This is the X-band and S-band antennas on Sentinel-6. And originally these parts here were going to be similar to the UHF antenna with an astro quartz structure with carbon coated polyam and wrapped around it like that barbershop pole. And then they saw that that was gonna to be too expensive to test. And uh, one of the RF engineers to do an initial test had a paper cup and he wrapped a wire around it and was using that as testing. Then someone looked at that, we could probably machine a piece of Ultem. Then someone said we could probably mold a piece of Ultem and then our 3D printing group saw it and they said we could 3D print a piece. So they did a lot of testing found that the 3D printing process would work and have positive margins. So an antenna wire wipes, wraps around these pieces. So the other one we have is Cold Atom Laboratory. It's actually on the space station. And these pieces are all good examples that basically they're more expensive to machine out of the plastic with these complex thin curves than to have them 3D printed. And you have OCO3, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, Again, that bracket was cheaper to 3D print than the machine, and SWAT has a bracket that also is a 3D printed part. And all the plastic that we use, the only flight approved uh, plastic we can use is the Ultem 9085. 
So the biggest challenge with 3D printed parts is the contamination control, the outgassing, which is why we only have the Ultem approved to be used for 3D printing. There's planetary production bakeouts. Some of the bakeouts have to be higher than the melting temperature of the Ultem or the, or it'll start to damage the Ultem. And the required design allowables for testing. So every time we 3D print something, we have to 3D print samples in every direction and at least print five to 10 samples to test to get a B basis allowables for that part. And the qualification testing of those parts, it gets very expensive very quickly on how much stuff you have to test. So when I talked to our 3D printing group about what they'd like in the future, ideally they said they'd like a lot more reliable date, vendor data. Again, we use the vendor data as an idea of where we start of what material we might use. We don't actually use it in our design allowable test or with our stress analysts we actually go and do a lot of the testing. If vendor data actually said we use this many samples, the number we are providing is an average or we're providing a B basis allowable number. And if they'd like more plastics they could use that are low outgassing and the possibility of using plastics that are conductive. So I'd like to talk about two projects that we have upcoming, the future missions and the challenges we have with them. The next two big flagship missions that JPL has is the Mars Sample Return Rover. And that has the same similar issues as Mars 2020 and Perseverance. They have high temperature planetary protection bakeouts because that rover is going to go and pick up the tubes that have the core samples and bring them back to Earth. So they wanna make sure that we don't take life to Mars or bring life from Mars back to Earth that we took to Mars. And the next one we have is Europa Lander. Unlike Europa Clipper, the lander on the surface of Europa, it will be, have exposures in the radiation in the gigarads. And the Europa Clipper satellite, when it launches, everything's deployed and it doesn't actively have many things that have to function in the high radiation environment. The lander will land and have stuff that actually has to take load, move and function at those high radiations levels. And the parts will have the constant radiation exposure to them. On Europa Clipper, as the satellite orbits Europa, it won't have the constant radiation as it gets further away from Jupiter. So that's kind of some of the upcoming stuff we have at JPL. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and I'd like to take any questions. Well, excellent, Eric. Thank you so much for um, for an awesome talk. Um, I know that you're having trouble hearing us. So what I will do, just so the panelists are aware, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, so please, if you have any questions, uh, send them in the Q&A. And I think Eric will be able to see those, um, if I'm not mistaken. And I will, um, while those are coming in, if there are any, uh, I will send Eric some questions that he can read and, and answer for us so that we can uh, hear a little bit more of his, his perspective. So let me just reach out to Eric um, with my first question, which will be, you know, first off, my, you know, for me personally, one of the questions that I have for Eric is, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's been sort of a dream or desire since I was a kid about working at NASA. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of wondering where, how he ended up at NASA. So I'll ask him, you know, um, you know, was it always his dream to, to work at NASA? Um, so working so for NASA, I ended up working at JPL in a very roundabout way. Uh, after my freshman year in college, I applied for many internships at schools, at companies local in Seattle, like Boeing, Intel and Microsoft, and every time I was told, we don't hire freshmen. And thankfully, my advisor at University of Washington met the lady at JPL who hires interns and told her about me, and I called her, and she ended up finding me a job, and I found the one main key was to tell her exactly what I wanted to do. And I told her I wanted to work with materials, and I did not want to sit in front of a computer all day long, and I was really interested in lab work. So she found the group that I currently work in still after about 20 some years. Uh, the craziest thing is as a child, I had no idea what Jet Propulsion Laboratory was. I did not know what it was until the recruiter called me and I looked it up and thought it sounded fascinating. And here I am today. 
Great. So FOD is foreign object debris. And if you have anything created of particles that can float around in space, they could get into things, into places you don't want them. So if you have something that cracks or breaks and creates a debris, typically in space, things go to the coldest thing, which is typically optics. So you could also, you also could plug some mechanisms that need to work. There's a lot of really tight tolerances on parts. And if you create FOD, you never know where your FOD is gonna go and what it could get into. So we avoid FOD at all costs. Great, so the next question I have uh, from, from uh, the audience is about um, uh, sourcing at NASA's materials. I'll ask, uh, I'll ask uh, Eric to comment on that. So our material sourcing at NASA, so typically we will go find a company that supplies the material we want. And if it's a company that uses vendors to distribute their materials, we cost out and we send what we want to our purchasing group and they decide who we actually purchase it from. So a lot of the stuff depends on the cost, the lead time. For example, if we want to use a specific company, we have to fill out paperwork that shows why we want to use that company. Uh, a lot of times we can justify the lead times are lower or we've used the material in the back in the past. Uh, JPL, we do use a lot of heritage stuff because if we've used it in the past, we've probably tested it and we trust our internal test data so we can reuse that data. So typically as an engineer, we'll find what we want fill all the paperwork out, send it to our purchasing group, and then they go re-quote everything, and then they per they decide who they purchase it from. Great. And, and on top of that, we also send out, we have a approved vendor list that we've sent people out. Our quality assurance people will go to the company, and uh, myself or someone in my group will also go out, and they will go and check to make sure that the company is following all of the specs that we want, that their internal specs are equivalent to our specs, and to make sure that the project, the product they are going to provide us is what exactly they're telling it, it, it is. Excellent. Uh, the next question I have, and I think we have room for maybe one or two more, um, is about uh, the Mars launch for July. And I'll ask Eric to comment. Uh, yes, the Mars launch still is scheduled for July. They have the ATLO team, which is a te assembly test and launch operations. Uh, that team left, some of them left JPL right after Christmas to go to Florida. The rover left JPL in mid-February and was flown on a C-17 to the Cape. Uh, they are there currently putting it together. Uh, some of the highlights are is last week they put the helicopter on the rover. Uh, the descent stage was fueled. The second stage of the ULA rocket was uh, left Alabama on its way to the Cape. And... NASA has uh, made that their number one goal is to launch the Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance, in July. The problem is if they miss the launch date, it's a two-year delay because you can only launch to Mars every two years to, uh, due to the planet alignment. Uh, for example, Curiosity was originally going to launch in 2010, but in 2009, early 2009, they realized that they were not gonna make it and there was too much testing that needed to be done and they made a decision to delay it two years. So a two year delay will end up costing hundreds of millions of dollars. So right now they have the whole team there, a lot of them self quarantine and they've dedicated themselves to the project. Great. And um, I think one, one last question then we'll transition over um, about 3D printing. What are the biggest challenges, biggest opportunity um, and, and vision forward? So 3D printing, the biggest challenge is just the testing and showing that the, at the beginning of 3D printing, what we found was the 3D printing, the properties of the parts that were being 3D printed were dependent on the settings on each machine and each machine was printing stuff a little bit different. And as the technology has advanced, a lot, of that's, a lot of those issues are going away. And the biggest challenge we have is just the amount of testing that has to be done and the size. 
the biggest opportunity, when I talked to the, a lot of the guys that, that work in the group, they said the biggest opportunity is they use a lot of it for molding more so than they do for the actual flight hardware. And they can get a lot of molds very quickly done. And a lot of our wire mock-ups, they use a lot of 3D printed parts to be able to use the mock-ups uh, to put all the wiring through. Uh, the biggest opportunity is just more materials. The more materials we have to use that have low outgassing can take the planetary protection bakeouts, the more parts we could 3D print. Uh, a lot of it also is a lot of people that work at JPL are fresh out of college. And a lot of people in college have had 3D printed parts around them a lot more. And in college, it's start to teach that's an opportunity. People at JPL that have been there a long time, back when they were starting as engineers, they basically only used either Mostly we use aluminum. It's kind of the most common thing. And it's, it's easy to look and go, oh, we should use aluminum or, oh, we should use like G10 flat stock. So now we have a lot of uh, newer engineers coming in that have a lot more experience and they will have, they'll slowly get that culture of, hey, we could 3D print this. So that's kind of the biggest challenge we have is just the, the technology is quite not as extensive yet but we have, we're slowly getting there. Awesome. Well, I'd like to thank my speak, our, the speaker again. I know um, I sent a note to him thanking him uh, for that. Uh, thank you for participating. And we have our next uh, keynote. And thanks again for joining this morning. Uh, have our next keynote in a few minutes. Hey, Scott, can you hear me? Hi, Eric, you there? I'm here, can you hear me? I can, perfect, thank you. It's okay. good, how's the audio? Is it, do I have to talk loud or is this uh, working? The audio is perfect, no, thank you. This okay. is great. So is this just going all the way till noon or we're just uh, so? What's that, uh, your talk? <laughs> oh, we're gonna go at 10.30, okay. So I, we got plenty of time. <laughs> no, I think, is it 10.30 or 10? I think it's at 10, right? Well, this, 10 to, this, ten, well so yeah, 10 to 10.30, 10.45, you have um, um, all the way up to 11.30 if you needed it, but uh, we'll keep it to, a, we'll keep it to an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I, I won't, I won't drag it on too, too much. It's just this, this, uh, this, this, this little ad with my face on it says 10.30. It's okay. Uh, okay, then I'm hoping, let me just uh, confirm. So how are things going with you and the family? That was Jessica. <laughs> yeah, things are good. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a house full with with Jess and I and three kids all kind of uh, running around. So um, uh, the the entertainment for this afternoon will be us sort of getting creative in 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 uh, what we do in, in sort of a lockdown situation. So. It should be a lot of fun. We, I, we've got the video game rock band. We formed our own rock band. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have a debut. It should be good. Oh, that's awesome. You can twitch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, my daughter is, you know, she's, she's, she's an only child, but she's, she's in her senior year in high school. So this was uh, disruptive, but, uh, but she was actually quite relieved the whole time. <laughs> a lot of her tests got canceled. She had already finished most of her stuff and has chosen a college. So seniors are all good. It's the juniors that are in. Who are. So we're live um, and uh, we can, um, 
we can probably get started in a few minutes, I think, right? That, uh, um, let me just confirm the, the time and we'll get rolling. Okay, it's uh, 10 one sorry for the delay, but uh, let's get started with our next, um, our next uh, keynote speaker. Um, let, I'll pull up the notes uh, just so that I, um, uh, there we go. So first off, thank you, Eric, for, um, for accepting the invitation to, to be here for, for the keynote. Um, I know Eric uh, from, uh, a little while ago, I, I did a postdoc at, at NIST, an NRC postdoc at NIST, where he was the head of the polymer division there. Um, has spent a year and a half or so there and, and got to know Eric really well. Uh, and we've kept in touch. So so that's it's it's been great to it's great to have you here. Um, uh, Eric, Dr. Eric Lynn is the director now of uh, materials and measurement laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. <clears throat> Um, where he serves as the, which serves as the nation's reference laboratory for measurements in chemical, biological, and material sciences. Um, MML activities include fundamental research in industrial relevant materials and processes, uh, development certification of materials and quality assurance, just to name a few things that, uh, that MML does. Uh, Dr. Eric Lynn uh, received his, uh, BSE from Princeton, master's and PhD from Stanford in chemical engineering. Um, and with that, uh, we'll try to get uh, your presentation up and and you ready to uh, present. Okay, well, I, can, uh, I can share, let me see. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I have to change one preference I didn't realize. No problem. Okay, let me start this again. 
Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm really excited to, uh, to be here. Um, we usually have quite a few people we send to, to SPE and Antec. And so uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to, uh, to present to you in this forum. Um, behind me, my uh, background, I've been exper experimenting with Zoom backgrounds. That is the, uh, the NIST campus in Gaithersburg, our primary campus. And, uh, and today, uh, what I'd like to do is to, uh, is, to, is to really give a, an overview of the Material Measurement Laboratory and what we do at NIST. Um, what we are focused on is advancing technology through measurement science. And what I hope to do is to have you have the audience and, and participants to get a sense of who we are as an agency, what our mission is, and how we go about executing that, that mission uh, in service to the country, and it's in particular US industry. Um, so I'll have a couple of examples to touch about how we're contributing to topics that have, uh, have a lot of prominence within the Antec program already. Um, and so uh, mostly what I'll be going through is in quite high level without going to a tremendous amount of detail. And I invite you to please ask any questions that you have, as well as to come visit us and engage with us. We are in public service and so we are working for you. Okay, so the, uh, the NIST mission is stated here. And we are an agency inside a Depart Department of Commerce. And our mission in the Department of Commerce is to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science, standards, and technology in ways that enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. Now, the key words here are US innovation, industrial competitiveness. Um, those, are the, those are the stakeholders that we serve in the Department of Commerce. What it basically states is that our interest is ensuring that U.S. industry is leading the world in its technology and in the growth of our economic security. The way we do it is through the blue words, measurement science, standards, and technology. And I'll say a little bit more about what that looks like, but these different components, measurement science, standards, and technology are underpinning the entire technological enterprise of the United States and has been a source of strength for the country as we maintain um, our leads in, uh, in technology in a variety of different, uh, different areas. Oops, let me, uh, sorry, I switched to the wrong one. Okay. So the, uh, so for the history of NIST is that the, we were founded in, in 1901 as the National Bureau of Standards, but the role for measurements in commerce for governments is, is starts at the beginning. In fact, is recognized in the US constitution where the government has, is responsible for a system of weights and measures. And as a government function that has served governments in all of human history, because of the essential need of having to foster commerce and trade for things like um, selling goods and having a common mass or weight standard, um, all the way to, uh, to basic um, measurements that we do today. I think the most ubiquitous one that NIST supports is that everyone knows of is that we keep the time. And if you think about commercial transactions, then, then time, of course, is a time stamp, stamp on every transaction and is an essential component of very uh, a, a huge number of measurements as well. Okay, so what does this look like in the modern world? Well, before I go into our specifics and related to, to Antec and the SPE stakeholder group, I just wanted to highlight that this past year, something really momentous happened for people who are really geeks about measurements and metrology. And that is that last year that the SI system of units was redefined um, that was done um, in 2018 in November. And it is the most significant change that affects all of world commerce in the last 130 years. And the main accomplishment was that all the fundamental units from the second to the kilogram are now defined by natural constants and are not traced to, a, to an artifact, a physical artifact that is held in a, in a vault in Paris all this time. And so this dream is realized. It was originally dreamed by Max Planck um, and, the, uh, and so what happens now is that now these measurements can be derived and so that you don't need a calibration instrument to be calibrated or sent to Paris, for example, for mass or the kilogram. But now if you started up a laboratory on Mars, as we heard in our previous talk, now you were able to derive all the calibrations to, the, to these units from the fundamental constants of nature. And so this is a huge philosophical and practical change in our system of units. Most people wouldn't see the difference in their day-to-day -day lives, um, but it's, uh, it's something that will definitely have an impact into the future. Okay, so that was a, a little aside about the, the history of measurement in the world. 
So just a little bit about NIST as a glance, uh, we like the tagline here, Industries National Laboratory. And what that conveys is that is the same kind of sense in a, in a national laboratory or a central R&D laboratory in that we are a resource that serves industry in particular. And we do that from a foundation of significant technical and scientific expertise, as well as trying to make a difference in, the, in how all, all these uh, organizations are doing their work. So to give you a sense of who we are, we have about 3,000 plus uh, federal employees with almost an equal number of associates. These are guest scientists, visitors, students who are working with us day by day, by day on one of our campuses, um, engaged in research um, all the time. And so what this fosters is an environment where we have a core set of expertise in our federal permanent staff, and we have a constantly dynamic changing environment with experts all around the world and the country working with us side by side, creating a really dynamic um, hub of ideas and solutions that serve US innovation and industry. Uh, to just reflect the quality of our staff, we are very proud of our five Nobel prizes in physics primarily, but also around the discovery of quasi crystals, for example. We have two main campuses in Gaithersburg and Boulder. The Gaithersburg campus is in my background. Um, a number of ways we inter interface with our stakeholders through collaborative institutes, um, businesses using our NIST facilities, and we have these external programs at the bottom that I'll describe in just a minute or two. Okay, so this is a sort of description of the NIST laboratory programs. At our core, we are a research laboratory. Uh, what I like to say and how Scott introduced in his, in his introduction as myself, I came to NIST as a postdoc and a postgraduate, a postgraduate experience is, is, a, is a significant percentage of a starting position at NIST to give you a sense of the level of expertise that we have. At NIST, we also cover a huge range of different technologies and is expressed within the expertise um, contained within each of these organizations on this chart. From my, the, my home laboratory, Material Measurement Laboratory, where we cover chemical, uh, biological, and material sciences, the physical measurement laboratory that keeps the time and is working on quantum states and control of that through the engineering laboratory where we have a lot of work on building standards and disaster resilience response. Um, Information Technology Laboratory is, is leading the country through cybersecurity, privacy, and artificial intelligence. The Communications Laboratory is, uh, is focused on the next generation communications such as 5G and 6G. And we have some national user facilities with very unique capabilities um, including a neutron center that produces neutrons for measurements, and I'll describe that at the, at the end of the talk. But overall, the range of technologies that NIST covers on a few campuses with our staff it covers so many aspects that it creates another type of uh, opportunity where the, the combination of these different um, levels of expertise can really contribute to high-level solutions that serve our stakeholders. And I hope to give you a few examples along the way. Okay. So our two main campuses are here in Gaithersburg and in Boulder. And then I just wanted to point out, this is just to highlight that our footprint does extend across the country. We have joint institutes, each of which have a specific facility or capability and partners that we have. Um, we have uh, two atomic clock signal stations, one in Colorado and one in Hawaii. And we have NIST centers of excellence that are definitely topic focused, but really aimed at advancing these, um, these areas. And they're in a forensic science and advanced manufacturing and uh, and uh, disaster resilience. Okay. So to, to, uh, before I go into some details, let me just give you a scope of some of the ways in which we express our work. Um, they're based, there are three different kinds of categories here that are, that are highlighted by color. So in the red on the upper left, these are current program areas of high priority for us. Um, advanced manufacturing, which includes things like additive manufacturing, 3D printing, et cetera. Cybersecurity, I said a little bit about, and disaster resilience, where our staff go in after a disaster to learn from that, that of the response so we can improve our resilience for the future ones. On the bottom, on the left, in the green, these are our core type of services that we provide. We work on documentary standards, and that would be through ISO and ASTM and dozens and hundreds of other organizations. Technology transfer, NIST is actually the agency charged with overseeing federal technology transfer, setting policies and guidelines and keeping track and best practices. And then measurement dissemination, similar to the SI, SI units and how to express them, as well as just uh, how to teach others so that their systems are, are at the cutting edge. 
On the far right in the blue, these are the technology areas that NIST as an institution is really focused on because of their importance to the future of the US economy and industry. So these are no surprise, they're impacting all industries, including the plastics industry. And they range from engineering biology or synthetic biology, where we want to harness, where the goal is to harness and control the power of biological systems to produce new materials, chemicals, and, and, and uh, medicines. The internet of things is dramatically changing manufacturing, of course, quantum information science and quantum computing, quantum encryption. NIST has always been a leader in the manipulation of atomic and molecular species and quantum states in order to produce things like atomic clocks that are precise enough to enable GPS. And finally, but not least is artificial intelligence. This is a capability that is transforming how we practice science and how we operate our economy. And NIST has a foundational role in the same ways we have for since 1901 around measurement science, standards, and technology. Okay, so to give you a sense of what our, our services look like, um, here is one which is around standard reference materials. And this is, these are products that are uh, that material measurement laboratory, my laboratory is responsible for. And what these are, I'm sure many of you if you have laboratories have used them or have purchased some of these items. They're basically very well characterized materials that have certified uh, uh, properties and parameters that come with the certificate with a discrete set of material that you can use to, for calibration of your instruments to for compliance with ISO or ASTM standards. And there are more than 1200 of these standard reference material products that are sold around the world every day. So then the picture here, you'll see that these are, if you can read the labels, these are uh, reference materials for vitamins and human serum. And these materials are used to validate nutritional information for food. And there is a whole series of these kind of materials for things like clinical testing, uh, for pharmaceutical manufacturing, for trace lead in PVC, for example. Um, and so these range from very simple materials like, um, like irons to much more modern and relevant SRM products today. Our most, one of our most recent ones is a monoclonal antibody standard reference material that is now a core uh, calibration quality control product for the pharmaceutical industry. And especially during this time of COVID-19 that is a, a, as a, has greatly enabled the pharmaceutical industry to ramp up production of new materials faster. Um, other types of reference materials include like uh, um, a reference uh, genome, which is now being used to test new ways of gene sequencing to make sure that it's producing the right sequence and the right answers to that. And a carbon nanotube standard reference material, which is highly purified so that you can separate that they are distinguished by not only the type of carbon nanotube, but also their, their length. And so all these materials are useful for baseline measurements to help advance new technologies. Okay. Documentary standards, I think, is very familiar for this, this community, I'm sure. Um, and NIST is not, does not set the standards in documentary standards. We support industry in voluntary consensus standard bodies. And this is a stark contrast to our sister agencies that focus on regulatory um, actions. You know, standards are not regulatory by design. They, since they are consensus, they, are, they help uh, accelerate the, the industries. Um, in ways that, uh, that benefit all in a pre-competitive mode. And our role to support these activities is really to bring our technical expertise and our um, industry expertise so that we can find the right solutions that both are correct, are of high technical value and quality while still advancing um, economic competitiveness. And so a lot of NIST staff over decades have leadership on many of these standards bodies because of the prime um, mission for ourselves to advance the, uh, the economic interest of the U.S. Okay, the last thing I'll say for the highlight is around um, our external programs that are focused on public and private partnerships, public-private partnerships, um, especially around uh, manufacturing. And uh, the two main programs I'll talk about uh, briefly are the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership and Manufacturing USA. Now these two programs are externally focused and they are supported, uh, supporting different centers around the country. And each of these have a different focus. So the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership is really focused on small and medium sized manufacturers and the challenges that they are facing and how to adapt to the future. And so during this time of the economic shutdown is uh, they are actively trying to support our small and medium manufacturers. 
Manufacturing USA is a little bit different in that is really looking at cutting edge manufacturing methods, the type of methods that the US needs to, to remain in front in uh, technological um, uh, in, in technology for the world. And, uh, and those are really focused around bringing industry together to solve pre-competitive problems to enable new industries. So going back to the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, this is just a map to show you just how many there are. There's a center in each state and they touch more than 26,000 manufacturers and they are actively involved in trying to support them in building their businesses. For Manufacturing USA, the main point of this, this slide is to just show you the range of the different types of advanced manufacturing areas that are being covered. And this network is coordinated at NIST, although it's funded through the whole of government primarily through DOE and DOD. And so you can see a lot of technologies that definitely affect and impacted and are influenced by the plastics industry from flexible and hybrid electronics in San Jose, California, um, America makes 3D printing and additive manufacturing, advanced composites, um, and as well to sustainable manufacturing and advanced fibers and textiles. Each one of these institutes is has is funded at roughly 75 to $100 million with a minimum of a one-to-one -one match of industry and government sponsorship. And these are centers that are dynamic with a lot of ideas and trying to solve problems to get these technologies to where they can enter the mainstream productivity of the United States. Okay, so I hope that gives you a, a sense of just how NIST works and what we do. We are focused on US industry. We are focused on the cutting edge of technology. And we do that by trying to support the underpinning measurements and standards that really enable them to, be, to, to thrive. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of my time, and I'm gonna go really fast, are to cover just four different example areas and give you a sense of how NIST is supporting these, these uh, technologies. So the first one is called Materials Genome Initiative or Materials by Design. And, uh, and what this is, is to highlight a whole new paradigm for how to think about materials development and deployment. Um, the previous speaker from JPL described just how long it takes to qualify materials. And so this is an approach to try to accelerate that. So the, the big idea for Materials Genome Initiative, which was started in about five to seven years ago, is to really take this core idea of a materials innovation infrastructure by integrating computational tools, experimental tools, and digital data. And it's that integration that's really most important. Now that's not a brand new idea, but the way and what we are able to do today with today's computational resources and internet connectivity is enabling a whole new way of what this can look like. The lead for this program is Jim Warren, and so if you have more questions, then I direct you to him. So the, the big idea I'll try to express in the next two slides, um, the, and one of them is this is this uh, current state from five, 10 years ago, which is usually called computational materials by design, where you have a series of length scales or simulations, and you go through an iteration loop where you might incorporate an experiment and data and models, and then you're using that for a specific product and you wanna get a material with a targeted property. Now these were practiced case by case, problem by problem. And so it was pretty effective at doing so, uh, but the big dream is to turn that into a standard practice for even materials that were not necessarily approached with that, that, that's, that traditional method. And this would include things like organic electronics and, and polymeric materials that can be turned into transistors all the way to biomaterials. So the big dream is to turn those single projects into an ecosystem and to structure it in a way so that all of these different ideas can be, be connected together to solve many more problems by design. And so in this case, instead of just one loop of computational design experiment, we want to have any organization, research group, or scientist who wants to do that to be able to pull tools that are in the public domain to be able to get there faster and not develop them on their own. And so you can see here, there are NIST roles in all different areas from enabling enhancing exchange of data by providing repositories and standards for how to share data. Um, we do that in a variety of different ways um, um, already, because we, for example, we sell standard reference data. So very um, uh, high value data sets that people can use to train their systems. Um, NIST has a role in improving inequality of models. So for example, if you do molecular dynamics of lamps, 
there's a lot of checks and you have to do to make sure that the parameters you use are, are relevant to your situation. And so we can collect those practices and assure the quality. And then at the very end, we also want to develop new methods and ways to enhance how you combine models and data from experiment and code all together so that they can be community efforts to solve big problems. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, there's a lot of different tools that we've been building and really experimenting with how they come together. I'll just leave a sum here as a high level for what we've done so far. Um, the first one is promoting data science, and that is really embracing data as a, as a resource. And so uh, it's not big data because scientific data turns out is not on the scale of really big data, um, but, it is, uh, but it is increasingly important in all many, many domains. Second one is trust in models, as I described before. And finally, is to use these approaches of integrated design to produce new materials. And at NIST, our research staff have come up with a few very exciting examples. One, for example, these super alloys, which are like six or seven element containing alloys that have very specialized properties. My personal favorite example is that we use these methods to try to design an alloy to replace the current alloy used for the nickel. And the driving force for that is because the current alloy from nickel costs more than five cents to make, which is not a really good business proposition. But they were able to come up with the candidate alloys within, within just a year when normally it would take up to five to 10 years to, to select a new alloy. And for the polymer folks, directed self-assembly and design of a block of polymers for a semiconductor lithography is another area where we've made a lot of progress. Okay, so, the, uh, so at this point, I would say that we've developed all kinds of tools to try to explore and try to support people and help them with their projects. These are just a list of different products that we've put together just from the NIST side. There's been many, many more across the government. You can learn more about them at mgi.nist.gov. Okay, and so there's a uh, modeling here as well. Now, the big, one of the important things of this activity is that because we want to integrate things that these are really, this is really an exercise in building communities and shared interest and in how that we share things that we together to, to raise all boats as it were. And we want to share data in a way that you can also practice and maintain your own uh, proprietary data as well and combine it with the shared data. And there's a lot of uh, modern methods of data management to how you can do that effectively. And so we, these, with these communities of practice around metals and alloys and additive manufacturing, we're fostering how to share data and how to do it, uh, share and build tools for like community-based codes, how do you do workflows. And we're building communities around different use cases, um, say specific problems where new material development may be very important. One place where we do that is at our Center of Excellence for Advanced Materials. This is the Center for Hierarchical Materials Design is based in the Chicagoland area. And they are really inviting many people to join them, both to learn how to use these tools as well as to participate in these use cases. And you can learn more about that at chimad at northwestern.edu. Okay. Now this first phase for the Materials Genome Initiative was really about what kind of tools could a materials developer use? And now what we're seeing that since the start of the materials genome initiative, you can see that the number of papers and even more so the number of businesses that are now using things like materials informatics, machine learning and material science. Um, this particular chart comes from, comes from Citrine Informatics and Bryce Meredig, which is uh, really growing quickly in demand for their services in this space. And we can see this transformation starting to grow for how this type of approach can really uh, change the nature of materials into the future. And so this next phase of what we want to do is to, um, is, to, uh, is to go to accelerate progress. And what that is, is that it's really moving towards the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so now adding these tools to layer on top of the vast array of data and models that we can do, is really going to add that extra flavor so that a lot of these discoveries and deployment into practice will be much faster. So just to give you an example of what this looks like, I have an example I really like from our metallurgy uh, groups. Um, and you can imagine how this looks like in a polymer setting that, that has happened as well, it's on its way. And basically what this is doing is trying to combine high throughput methods and artificial intelligence to create autonomous material science platforms. And so in this case, AI is not just used to analyze or to look at the data, but AI is used to drive the experiments to help accelerate discovery or to maximize information 
with the least amount of time. And so the key here is this third bullet in the middle, which is to provide AI control over an experimental system. And so let me just show you what that looks like on the next slide. So what this is showing is that it's a, it's a basic ternary phase diagram. And the phase diagram was not known for this particular system. And now a combinatorial library was built using a thin film vapor disposition. And then the, the AI is controlling a synchrotron line to take specific measurements of the structure to try to map out the phase boundaries for this diagram. And what you're seeing is the selection of the AI on where to take the data and then adjusting to try to, to get to the final phase diagram as efficiently as possible. And so this was an order of magnitude faster and was just a demonstration case of how to combine not just AI for looking at data and correlations, but to also incorporate scientific principles into its discovery. And so in this demonstration example that was done a few years ago, um, there is now accelerating a lot of what we do at NIST to try to advance and accelerate how we do measurements and discovery for very complex systems that might involve processing multiple components, inorganic and organic materials. Um, so it's just opening up the the, the world to a whole new way of doing things. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me just say that, so this is just the beginning and there's still many big questions that arise about like what is, if a machine learning or AI tells you of a quantity or property, say a qualification test, then what's the uncertainty on it? There's not really an easy answer to that. And now with the additional of other type of technologies, including additive manufacturing and the incredible synthetic control we have over things like poly new polymeric materials and new feedstocks and chemical recycling, then the opportunities just expand exponentially and we're really going to need tools like this uh, for the future. Okay, so let me uh, switch topics to a different topic, which is related but related, which is 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Okay, I think I'll just go really quickly here. I don't really need to say a whole lot of this topic. There's a lot of excitement here at Antec already. Um, and so let me just go, you know, here there's a lot of uh, different ways, especially for our polymer and plastic materials of how to do additive manufacturing. But of course, the main uh, common element is joining um, materials to, from 3D model data and then to build it layer by layer in a variety of different ways. Now, what we did at NIST is that we had a workshop that engaged stakeholders from industry, academia, and government. And specifically around polymers and additive manufacturing, we were really focused on what were the measurement needs and standards needs that were barriers to the full realization of this technology. And so it was broken down into different topics like the characterization of materials through this whole life cycle, process modeling, in situ measurements for processing to enable process modeling, and then ultimately, of course, this performance. We had a huge amount of activity and, and energy around it and a report was generated that really highlighted these barriers. And this is just one example of cross-cutting challenges that touch upon all kinds of different topics like collaboration, business models, life cycle and sustainability, variability in equipment and uh, printer settings, et cetera. And so there are certainly many, many different challenges to solve before it can achieve um, bulk scale um, production as a manufacturing technology. Now the NIST role in all of this is really trying to support how the, the full workflow of additive manufacturing. So for example, in the top line, if you have a digital model, then you have all these uncertainties about whether or not your final part has the properties and performance that you want. There's uncertainties in the input material properties, uncertainties in the equipment and the process. Um, you might be able to turn a knob correctly, but how do you compare between instruments or machines? So to support that underneath, what NIST is doing is to is to do the research and identify the key measurements for process modeling, materials characterization, new methods for in-situ measurement, and to connect all these together so that you can predict and be confident in its ultimate performance. And there are a lot of gaps in how we do that today. So for in particular, this uh, for FDM uh, materials extrusion type of method, um, then here are some of the, the topics that we've been supporting. And so we have in-process measurements starting with thermography, uh, thermal profiles on the right time scale. We have materials characterization to look at its rheology. We have a process model that uses both reptation and constitutive models for non-equilibrium conditions that are often used in these processes. And then we want to connect that all the way to performance mode. In this case, it's really a, a weld strength because that's really what's, what's the key um, structural component of, of how these parts are, are printed. 
And so with uh, what we've done with combining all these things is to put together a full package, very much in like the materials genome initiative style, a process model validated by very high precision measurements and then connecting it so that prediction and, uh, and consistency can be achieved. Okay. Um, we do the same thing around photopolymerization where this slide is just really just to show there's many, many different problems and things you wanna control uh, from, from optical exposure to the, the cure kinetics of the resin um, to the interfaces that arise. One, one, uh, one development that we're particularly proud of is this, is this instrument that was built in by our group in Boulder, uh, Jason Kilgore, Callie Higgins. It's a voxel scale nanomechanics that for photopolymerization added to manufacturing. And basically what they've done is they turn an AFM tip into a photopolymerization instrument. So you can measure the mechanical properties with the AFM while doing the photo curing with the laser at the same time. And so you can do a real-time measurement of the change in its properties under conditions that be relevant to photopolymerization. The last thing I'll mention here is similar to MGI in that we have this activity that we started called AM Bench, Additive Manufacturing Bench. And what this is, is a public, it's a consortium uh, set of meetings, which is focused on highly controlled benchmark measurements for additive manufacturing where there's agreement amongst all the participants for a particular build challenge, and then uh, many, many groups trying to develop models for that build. Then every two years, the modelers and the data are combined and the community learns together about how well that model worked. And by iterating this over time, then the models and the performance of those models be dramatically improved. This was inspired by metal forming where a similar activity was started more than two decades ago and since that activity has started, the time for metal forming, sheet metal forming into manufacturing reduced the time to product by orders of magnitude benefiting the entire industry. And so with additive manufacturing coming up, this is a, an early stage time to really achieve the same kind of acceleration across a range of material sets. So the next meeting is AM Bench 2021, and you can learn more about it here at nist.gov AM Bench. Okay, let me just go to, uh, I'm gonna run out of time here. So let me just say a little bit about the circular economy and marine microplastics. And that's definitely a topic that's been prominent here as well. Um, and in the same spirit, it's uh, NIST has a very distinct role that underpins it through measurement science standards and technology. And circular economy and materials development and manufacturing are interesting in that they are unified by being systems problems where you can't just do a single experiment on one place. You really have to, uh, you have to consider the whole system as a whole when you design where you're gonna make a big difference. So in circular economy, and our program lead here is, is Kate Beers. Um, I don't wanna go through this charts. It's mostly there are a lot of charts about how it's a systems problem. And I think the, the, the challenge and opportunity are, are quite, quite clear. Uh, the main thing I wanna point out here is that this is not just a NIST activity. We partner with our sister agencies and uh, the Manufacturing USA Institutes, as well as NSF, ACS and the National Academies um, to know where we should focus our energies. And they basically follow around these different type, different, uh, different areas. Um, one is, um, so, let me go back. Okay. so we have new processes and materials and that is more new and mechanical and chemical recycling routes and reference materials. And then of course these automated synthesis and area pl platforms. In a second big area, we wanna provide data and economic analysis. Our engineering laboratory has a very well-established life cycle analysis tool and reference data sets that we can provide to help with the analysis of circular, circular processes. And of course, the environmental impacts and how to monitor are, there are many, many different challenges that NIST is starting to address as well. In the same spirit of our Chai Med Center of Excellence, we have also engaged in building up a network around plastic recycling uh, problems. And so for example, in Alabama in 2011, um, the state paid 25 million disposal costs of recycled materials that were valued at $193 million. And uh, so they've been taking steps to address that. And so in, in just a, a year and a half ago, uh, Congress funded a program in recycled plastics that is now being uh, set up with Troy University, Pittsburgh State University in Kansas and KW. And this is starting to build a network that'll build the workforce of the future and to explore concepts of foundational concepts and then 
in the NIST role around the topic of plastics recycling. The area where we had a lot of activity already was a lot of different measurements to help monitor plastics pollution, especially in the marine environment. And of course, the impact is, is enormous as we've learned already through the many other talks in this meeting. Um, and in this chart, really just pointing out the uh, Great Pacific uh, patch of plastic, uh, which is close to Hawaii. And we do actually have a lab and one staff member here near Hawaii for, to, to help with this project. And so the, 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 the National Science and Technology Council has, has led a, a number of reports about the priorities needed to address this uh, problem. And you can see that many of them really fall within the, the mission space and the expertise of NIST. So we need established reliable and reproducible methods to monitor marine debris, to quantify them. We need to know the degradation mechanisms and the fragmentation. We also need the development of maybe biodegradable plastics. And we need to monitor all this with high quality measurements. Um, so one particular challenge is really around the microplastics and nanoplastics, plastics that, um, that are found in nearly all parts of the environment. And so how do you sample and find and count plastic particles per unit of sample? How do you account for its mass per unit of sample? And even further, how do you identify what they are and where they come from? Okay. And so a lot of the work around the world is really starting to move into a standardization. And so there are a number of reports that, that show that this is necessary. And of course, we at NIST with our partners around the world are starting to figure out and try to identify how to do this uh, best. Um, so it's not a surprise that we have a lot of the similar types of activities in this area led by Jennifer Lynch, who is based in uh, Hawaii at the moment. Best practices, reference materials and how to transfer technologies. What we're doing is we work with all the partners to try to figure out what's the right thing to do. Um, and so we have a lot of different partnerships and activities already that are shown here. So for example, we're working with um, Chevron Phillips and Thermo Fisher to use IR to rapidly identify plastic marine debris that have been collected. And then we can connect that with location information and start to figure out where the flow of materials goes. We have reference materials for a number of different kinds of recyclable materials that we're starting conversation with the American Chemistry Council. And into interlaboratory comparison, we're working with our international partners around the world as this is not a single country issue to solve. Okay. okay the last topic I'd like to cover is a shift in focus and that is about using high-end measurement capabilities that are often seen as esoteric in the realm of particle physics, but how it is that we are using them to advance industry um, industry in the US. And this topic is around neutron measurements and the NSOF consortium. Okay, so at NIST in Gaithersburg, we're fortunate to have this unique facility, which is a nuclear reactor that produces neutron beams. The neutron beams enter a guide hall, which is pictured here. And each one of those blue columns is basically a line where neutrons come down and instruments are used to perform measurements. Now, why neutrons are so powerful for industry is because a neutron interacts with, in, with, with, um, with elements differently. And in particular, hydrogen and deuterium are seen differently. So you can imagine hydrogen could be a white particle and then deuterium would be a black particle. That's how big the difference would be to a neutron. And so what that means, especially for plastics and polymers, is that you can selectively label parts of a polymer with deuterium and these neutron beams can see the differences between them, even though chemically they're almost identical. The other problem is that these type of measurements are very um, esoteric and, and are, um, but are very, very powerful. And so we identify through our lead, Ron Jones, a couple of what we're calling market failures, that industry needs and can use national facilities like our neutron source or synchrotrons to innovate. The art facilities see industry as a key customer, but the access models are geared toward proposals and academic research groups. So at NIST, what we've done is built a consortium with industrial relevant metrics of success in mind. In this case, the industry need is high, so there's not really a need to go through a one year, six month proposal cycle. And what we do at NIST is we design research and new capabilities in partnership with industry. And these are all open studies that are published into the literature. And the main thing that we're delivering is not so much the measurement, but really we're delivering expertise. And our members and our industry partners now know how to use these neutron measurements they can come in and there are proprietary modes where they can get answers quickly that can only be done, received through a neutron beam. 
And then in the end, we achieve our mission of advancing uh, innovation and, and industry competitiveness. So right now we have a, a large number of co companies at the moment. And, uh, and you can see from just reading the list of companies from 3M to Braskem and Corning to Regeneron, there's a wide range of different topics of, of technology areas from pharmaceuticals to material suppliers to automotive and energy companies. And what is interesting is that a lot of the problems that they have are common. And so we really focus on common problems across industry sectors through a unique facility like our neutron source. Let me just give you a quick couple of highlights. Uh, one is this around shale gas extraction. And in this case, neutrons can probe shale gas, uh, shale gas uh, structures differently than, than x-rays can. You can see or where the organic material are. And so just this one imaging method led to a tremendous amount of interest. And in this case, Aramco just put in shale cores directly and were able to measure the pore size, the chemistry and where the, the oil and gas were. And this was recognized by the Petrochemical Society as a significant advance, as well as in the nature communications. Another area where we're focused on industry problems is high shear manufacturing of, of soft materials, um, emulsions and formulations. And basically the shear rates you can get in most academic groups were nowhere near what is industry relevant. And so our team here matched, developed a high shear rate um, cell to look at the material under these conditions. And now they can reach 1 million inverse seconds and shear rates in a neutron beam. And now these are directly addressing processing challenges from some of our, our industry members. Okay, so, uh, so I hope I'm gonna end here and just leave our NIST mission statement up here. I hope I've given you a sense that NIST is an exciting place that really serves the country by focusing on US innovation and industri industrial competitiveness. And we do that at the cutting edge of measurement science, standards, and technology. So I'll end there and really be happy to open any kinds of questions and, um, and please come see us. It, this all depends on engagement and with our stakeholders um, around, around the US. Thank you. Awesome, well, well, Eric, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be here and, and share all the, the awesome things that, that NIST is doing. Um, I encourage everyone to uh, to ask questions. If there's anything you you want um, more information on clarification, please uh, throw it into the uh, Q and A window, um, and and I will sort of moderate through the questions and, and ask Eric. Um, and while they're uh, while these questions are getting populated, maybe I'll start with one, Eric. Um, sure. So. Um, you know, I thought I was pretty connected to NIST being in this postdoc and, and we connect and a number of other colleagues connect, but there's so much going on at NIST, uh, very connected with, um, with the needs of, of society and the industry and, and, and so forth. So it's, it's awesome to see, um, you know, one of the common threads I see is around data, how to collect data, how to standardize data, um, and, and how to leverage that to uh, accelerate, um, you know, industry manufacturing and, and, and so forth. Um, can you speak a little bit to some of maybe the challenges on, on, you know, how to get the data in sort of a format that can be, you know, used and distributed throughout? And then maybe um, from maybe a less technical standpoint, how do you share the data when data is so powerful yet uh, can be very proprietary in, in, in many cases? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Those are those are really good questions. I, I don't think we have all the answers for this. We always hear it, but it's uh, I think what it, around the data in particular, um, the main challenge is not so much technological in that a lot of the tools exist for today. A lot of it is really around culture and practices about how we put things together, just to make things interoperable. So, for example. Um, um, you know, what you really want to do is you want to be able to go to a place and you'll know how the data is formatted, you know where it comes from, there's a common set of terminology. And so there's some predictiveness about that that goes around that. So one good example from the bioscience is around, is around gene data or a sequencing data. So within a DNA sequence, which is a very straightforward actually type of data problem, it's a sequence of four different bases that you report but there are a lot of infrastructure or practices for the community around, well, what's the format of that data? How is it annotated? And how do you look at its provenance? Within material spaces, and especially in polymers and plastics, 
you know, there's not even a single way to describe how you might talk about polyethylene and which polyethylene and then which beth, which, which batch, et cetera. And so how can you share when there's not really a, even a common exchange of, of how you describe the data? That's what we call it, the metadata problem. So the community building effort is really trying to gather interested parties that have a core interest in integrating data to just describe how to talk about it and to share it. That's really the first step. And those are just still nascent, nascent um, activities all around in different pockets that we're trying to foster, but are, we can't make anyone do. So for example, if you wanted to do something around plastics recycling, then you know, there'd be a collection of recycling people who could, who could try to describe what that, what that looks like. So that's a cultural problem. Second one is that once you have that, then how do you, what kind of technology do you use to put it together? That is still a big transition point to where it used to be not very many people learn how to code or manipulate data, and now you kind of can't live without it. And so where does that go into the curriculum? And how, what do you do with people and companies that have already are familiar with a different mode of operation? The last question around the proprietary data is an interesting one. Um, companies like Citrine Informatics are really trying to solve this problem by, by doing a combination of what we call federated data. And what that means is that we, there's a benefit to having a public corpus of data like the genome data bank, gene data banks in the biospace so that there, everyone can access what that is. Maybe that might be, it might be basic thermodynamic data, for example. But then what you can do is you can register your data sets by saying what you have, but you do not make the data itself accessible. And we are working to convince companies that that is an advantage, a strategic advantage to take that position. So if you're a company that had a lot of data around the spectroscopy of a set of, of polymers, for example, you could say we have spectroscopic data of these polymers and what kind it is and what does it look like, but you don't have to give the data, um, make it available right away. And so by making it known, then people can contact that company and say, well, you know how to use that data or we can support it in some way. And then individual agreements can be made for how to share the actual data itself, but not what data is around. And so that would be a culture shift around it and the tools to how to do that are not really fully there. We're still in the stage of just trying to educate and bring the community together. Well, excellent. I, I, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but, but you have to start somewhere and it looks like there's been a lot of activity, a lot of thought around that. So um, very exciting to see and, and certainly very important to, to um, the industry. Um, one other question from, uh, from, from uh, David on, on the, um, online. Uh, does NIST also connect and collaborate with other standards bureaus across the world? Uh, for example, South Africa also has a standards bureau, bureau uh, SABS. Um, and just curious, you know, what other sort of global collaborations NIST may be involved in? We do. We call them National Metrology Institutes. Um, so every country has a measurement system because that's a core function of government, a system of weights and measures. Um, and so we, there is a, and, and we get together with our, with our colleagues around the world annually, um, largely around activities like the redefinition of the SI, but there are many, many working groups around um, assurance for clinical medicine practices, uh, chemical measurements, measurements of gases, for example. And we host a lot of exchanges to share these measurement practices around the world. Now, the other institutes around the world do not have the level of technical scientific sophistication that the US has in NIST. Um, no country covers the breadth of what NIST covers, and we are often supporting the rest of the world by how to take these new steps into stitching the international system together. Um, and so it is a very collegial and a very um, a supportive environment. Um, so for things like, like uh, COVID-19 testing, you know, that cannot be done just by one country. It is best to disseminate to the best practices for that. For things like um, trace elements in, in polymers and plastics, you know, that has to be shared as well and how to quantify that. So we work collaboratively as much as we, as we can. We help promote and advance those areas. That's an interest for the United States. And, uh, and it takes the whole world to work together because the, because the, the nature of the, the, the global economy these days is, is very interconnected. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience, uh, modeling software packages such as field force modeling and, and maybe some of the other things that are developed uh, at NIST or in collaboration with, with folks uh, in NIST involved, 
Are they open to the public? Is that something that people can leverage, use, or, or, or how do people get access to, to some of those capabilities? There are a, a number of packages available. I would say we're not really in the commercial force field molecular modeling um, area. We try to support those commercial products as much as possible, as well as open source uh, packages such as LAMPS, which of course is, is used worldwide. So I would encourage uh, the, the questioner to go to mgi.nist.gov to see where we started. There are a number of free packages around things like uh, we have a Python-based package for finite element for differential equations to solve differential equations, a phase field model. We have a package that helps you calculate um, average quantities by, with, for arbitrary shaped objects, for example, like radius of hydration or radius of gyration. Um, and then we invite people to try to join us in how to validate force fields. That is still an ongoing effort. Again, it's a cultural and community effort to do so. So there are a number of tools and resources, probably not ones that could be used in practice in industry on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the way that you might use um, some of the commercial packages. Great. Now, in, in sort of that same vein of, of, of collaboration and, and, and working with NIST, um, if a company finds something that, that uh, is really interesting that they want to work with NIST, um, how do they go about establishing that relationship? You know, what are the steps, if there are any requirements, you know, what, what can they do to, to get more involved, to, to collaborate and start that relationship? Yeah, so the, uh, there are several ways to, to go about it. So the main part is to just, uh, is to start with, is our mission space address a problem of, of interest for your, for, for your company or your organization? Um, now, finding the right place to solve that problem is always a challenge, but we have a number of, of approaches to, to do so. Um, first of all, we have a number of these centers and places where we collect and workshops where we collect stakeholders together. And so if you see them on our announced on our public webpage, then we certainly encourage people to just to come and participate. And we, we spend a lot of our time listening to the community to make sure we're doing what's going to make the biggest difference. If there are more specific questions, even to just like in like you would expect from a industrial or central R&D laboratory about answering questions, we do answer every question we get. And if you say, for example, contact myself, my email is, is, is pretty straightforward and easy to find. Then, then we are very good at directing individuals to the experts that can hopefully provide an answer to any question like that. Now, as we get to more and more specific areas, we want to know what are the big barriers that are facing entire industries that we can help solve, pre-competitive problems that we can solve with a unique capability or measurement. And we wanna hear about them all the time. So it's really about engaging in a conversation with our staff, wherever you enter into it, we can usually find a pathway to where that problem is not unique and how to collect them together. We may direct you to a center like Chimad. We may encourage you to join our NSOF consortium. We may direct you to buy a particular set of materials in the SRM program or explain whether it's relevant to what you need to do. Um, so there's not one any one way of doing it, but the starting point is just to contact someone from our organization. Excellent. Uh, another question from the audience from Rebecca. Uh, do projects uh, cross mission spaces? For example, sustainable advanced manufacturing and you've got a number of initiatives do they talk to each other how do they how do they um uh cross communicate and so forth they definitely do so uh so like the rest of the world the connectivity and the need for multidisciplinary solutions is just a requirement these days and we are very fortunate to have all the expertise on one campus or several just a few campuses as well so sustainable advanced manufacturing is a very good example of that you know so we have an engineering laboratory that has tremendous expertise in robotics and the internet of things on a manufacturing floor, as well as life cycle analysis, economists and social scientists that look at behavior of systems that involve people. And we can connect that with our material measurement laboratory where we are really focused on what is the core science of a material transformation under manufacturing. When, it's a, when you have a limited set of materials to, to do in a sustainable manufacturing method, um, then how are the details of that process modeling and the specifics of the manipulation of that material connected? So we have a lot of projects that work on these teams together and it becomes a very dynamic type of environment to really solve these problems. So in the circular economy, for example, I tried to show how that might connect. We have marine pollution, plastics pollution monitoring. 
but those screening methods are really good for pre-development for new plastics and materials. We have an economics to do life cycle analysis, and we have data and AI experts to try to stitch the entire system of information together. I wouldn't say we know exactly how to do that to the fullest efficiency and effectiveness possible, but we're really doing our best to do so. Awesome, well, that's perfect. So um, maybe one last question for me, um, and, and if there are others, uh, please post them into the chat, but uh, or the Q&A panel. But we talked a little bit about uh, collaboration and, and coordination with, um, with, with companies and industry, but uh, near and dear to my heart, and you had mentioned too, you know, that uh, there's a lot of uh, postdocs at NIST. Uh, so for those folks that are, are pursuing a postdoc, maybe even a career at NIST, um, you know, the students and, and others in the, in, the, in the audience, can you speak a little bit to how, how you might go about uh, getting a postdoc at NIST and, and collaborating from that level? Absolutely. Uh, new ideas and, and uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic people, we're always searching and working to engage with that. Um, and, and for Scott and myself, you know, the entry level, as I said, at the beginning is, uh, is after your PhD for, uh, in, in large part. You know, the best way to do that is the same way as before, is that if you, we are looking for people who are interested in what we're doing, and then this first step is just to reach out to, uh, to a researcher and to inquire um, whether or not they have a project for a postdoctoral pro program that would be of interest. Now, there is a full list of these projects within the National Research Council Postdoctoral Research Program, a program that both Scott and I were, were in. And that is a very rich resource that gives you a snapshot of all of the projects that our staff really want to pursue or need to pursue and are trying to match make with those who are seeking a postdoctoral opportunity. And so you just look through that catalog of different projects, you'll get a starting point for who to contact. And really the choice is trying to find the right match between interests and skills and availability. Now, in addition to the postdoc program, we do have an undergraduate research program. We have a high school research program. And we also have a lot of visitors from industry that, um, or universities that, that, that visit us and work with us for a period of a few days to a few months to a few years. So there's a wide range of different opportunities. It's really just starting to, to ask about them and to talk to us. But for the postdocs in particular, the National Research Council program uh, list of projects is a good place to start. Perfect. I think that's time for us. I appreciate, again, your time with us sharing everything that NIST does. Uh, I encourage everybody in the audience, if you have additional questions or, or what would like to coordinate or collaborate, reach out to Eric or somebody within his, his organization. Uh, there's a wealth of information um, you know, from, my, from my own experience. So um, very good. Thank you so much for being here and uh, enjoy the rest of Virtual Antech. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. And for the rest of everybody else, I think our next uh, keynote speaker is at 1130. So, um, you know, 